Uh, if you got a Bible with you, go ahead and open up to the book of Mark. Today we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. <clears throat> um, and as you're opening there, I want to tell you about um, the mo- who I think is the most patient person that I have ever met. And that is my wife, Brittany, who many of, many of you know. Um, but she has been very patient, specifically with me, forever. So we've been, we've been married for um, uh, about to be 13 years. And, but we, we started dating in middle school. So we've been together for like almost 25 years. And throughout that time, she has waited on me to do everything. She, I have dragged my feet when it comes to everything. And she has been patiently waiting. And I think specifically to uh, the night that I proposed, the night we got engaged. So how, how this worked is we had been together for a long time, obviously. And we were, we were pretty much already planning our wedding at that point before I had actually proposed. Um, <laughs> So, so she knew it was coming. Like it, it was coming at some point, and uh, and so I, I kind of I, I got the ring. I decided when I'm going to do it, and it was I, we I planned this date for us. But the thing about it is, is I, I didn't have like any money at that time, so it was very rare that we went on nice dates. So it was pretty obvious that like this was the night that it was going to happen. <laughs> and so I pick her up. We go out to this nice dinner, and the whole time during dinner, like my my plan is by the end of this night I will have proposed. But that was as far as my plan went. And so the whole night during dinner, I'm just like, okay, now, and like almost doing it, but then backing off and not quite knowing what to do because I didn't know, like, I don't know if anyone here has ever proposed in a restaurant before. I didn't know if it was going to be like the movies where like everyone claps and like gets excited, (laughs) which sounds terrible to me. Like I, especially when I was younger, hate being the center of attention. And so that sounded terrible. But then I'm thinking like, what if nobody claps? That's even more awkward. If everyone's just like going about their dinner and I'm on my knee and everyone's just like having to get around me to get their food and stuff. And so the whole dinner, I'm just thinking like, I'm not sure when to do it. I don't know when to do it. And then the bill comes, I pay it, and it's time for us to go. And I haven't done it yet. And so now I'm like panicked. I'm thinking I gotta, I can't propose drive, on the drive home. Like I gotta, something has to be memorable here. And so we go outside and lo and behold, the Lord works in mysterious ways. We go out in this, we're in this downtown area and look across the street and across from there, there are these kind of ponds and over those ponds, there are these bridges, which I knew about, but it was kind of dark. What I didn't know is at night, they're all very, they're beautifully lit. And so we go outside and there's just like this scenery that we can take a walk through. I'm like, okay, we're not done yet. And so <laughs> we, we're walking and it's, it's every, every bridge we're walking over is nice, but every time it's like, Someone else is walking past, or something is going to be awkward, which none of it would have been awkward. I just was, I don't know, nervous that she would say no, even though we already, like, planned the wedding. <laughs> and so we're, we're kind of getting, going over these bridges. We're going further and further, and the lights are starting to get a little bit behind us. We're kind of getting further away from it, further away from the car. It's getting a little bit later, so I'm not sure what to do. And so we come, we come across this bench that's on one of the bridges, and we're like, all right, let's just, let's just park here and sit and chat for a little bit. So we sat, we talked for a little bit, it was nice. We just like reminisced and, and talked and then we just kind of kept talking and the night kept going on and nothing was happening. <laughs> kind of running out of things to talk about. And then eventually she said what I was really dreading her saying. So eventually she was like, you know, it's getting kind of cold. You want to go back to the car and leave? I was like, no. I was like, okay, okay, I got to do it now. I was like, well, hang on a minute. And so I did it. I got down on one knee and I proposed and it was wonderful. And she said, yes. And I don't remember any, any of it. I had to verify this information with her because I like, blacked it out. I was so nervous. <laughs> but I, I asked her about it this week. We haven't really t- haven't talked about it in a long time. I was like, did you think, did you, A, did you know I was going to propose that night? She's like, of course. Like, <laughs> where, did you think it was going to happen in the restaurant? She's like, yep. She's like, when, when dinner ended, I had, didn't know what was going on. And then I thought you were going to propose here and you didn't. She's like, I didn't know what you were waiting on because you knew I was going to say yes. But I just couldn't, I was so nervous to do it that I just kept making her wait and wait, and wait. And thankfully it worked out. But the reality is, waiting can be really hard sometimes. In that case, she, she knew what the outcome was going to be. We both did, so it, was kinda, it wasn't a big deal in the long run. But sometimes waiting can feel like a really big deal. And sometimes waiting really is a big deal. Sometimes we're waiting on something that is far more serious, like waiting for the phone to ring, waiting to hear about a diagnosis, or waiting to hear from uh, a child that you haven't heard from in a long time, where you're just waiting, or waiting on God, wait, praying for something and waiting on God to do something, and that season can be really, really difficult. And so this is the question I want us to think about and talk about this morning. 
And it's how do we faithfully wait on God? How do we faithfully wait on God? We're going to come across seasons, whether you're in them right now, where there's always going to be times where we're waiting, where we have to wait on God to act or to answer in the way that we're expecting. But how do we do that faithfully as followers of Jesus? How do we faithfully wait on God? Well, today we're going to look at the book of Mark as we continue this series, and we're going to look at um, kind of a well-known story, but a story of the disciples, and we're going to see how they did slash didn't wait on Jesus to act, and we're going to see what we can learn from them. So where we are in this story, what we saw last week is we saw Jesus teaching uh, through parables. We we went through a handful of parables last week, and Jesus is teaching from uh, kind of at the Sea of Galilee. He's teaching from a boat, and so the way that the setup is, is if you if you kind of go a little bit out from shore in a boat because of the surrounding mountains, uh, you're able to kind of project more and able to be heard more. And so that's what we saw last week. That's what Jesus is doing in this um, kind of period there in this day. And then where we're picking up is kind of at the end of the day. So he'd been teaching all day, and then we pick up in verse 35 is right after that. And it says this, starting in verse 35. It says, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. So all this is saying is, once Jesus was done teaching for the day, he asked his disciples to take him in a boat across the Sea of Galilee. And so it says he took, they took him just as he was, so it's saying he didn't go back home first, or they didn't do anything first. It was when he's done teaching, they... they pretty much went as they were and sailed uh, to the other side of the sea. In verse 37, it says, And and then a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. And and I think this is interesting. Details like this in, in stories of the Bible, I think what they do is they really show kind of the reliability of Scripture. Because what we know, even still to this day, is the Sea of Galilee is kind of placed at kind of, kind of like a, a basin with mountains surrounding it. And so what happens is it gets a lot of uh, downdrafts coming from the mountains, and, and uh, these storms can kind of come up out of nowhere. Even still to this day, it has the nickname of a boiling cauldron because it can just all of a sudden kind of look like a boiling you know, pot where uh, the waves get really rough and the sea gets, and the winds get really rough. And so that's what's happening here. And it, this is something that wouldn't have been uncommon, but even the uh, you know, some of Jesus' disciples were experienced fishermen. Even them, as we're going to see, were, were terrified at how big this storm was. But storms like this were common. This wasn't an uncommon sight for them. So as we see in verse 38, the storm was already um, going. The, the boat was filling with water. And it says, But he, being Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? So it, I think Jesus sleeping here, it tells us, it shows us a couple things. I think the first thing it shows us is his humanity. Jesus had been teaching all day, and at the end of the day, he was tired, and he went to sleep. And I think that that's as detailed as it gets. Like, I don't don't, don't necessarily think Jesus went to sleep here because hopefully the disciples would wake him. This would be a good story on faith. We could teach it a couple thousand years later. I think he was just tired, and he went to sleep. But what this also does is it shows Jesus' trust in the Father, you know, this, this storm coming up out of nowhere was not, and they may not have expected it right here, but it was not an uncommon thing, so this wouldn't necessarily have taken everyone by surprise. But he still, even though this would have been, um, you know, a potential storm they could be sailing into, he still had trust in the Father that he could sleep and that he would be safe. And I think from this little section of the story, one of the most important things that we can learn here, this may not be the over, the, the biggest, you know, lesson from this entire story that we're going to talk about, but from this little section right here, as you see Jesus falling asleep here, I think what we need to learn here is that you need to sleep. And that's it. You need to sleep. I need to sleep. We are all tired all the time. And if Jesus needed to sleep, you need to sleep. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, I, I've said all the things that, you know, if I, if I, if I nap, which, like, is, that's hilarious. But, like, if, if, you, if, if I do this, my work won't get done. The things I want to accomplish won't happen. Things will get dropped. And the reality is we need to have some trust in the Father that things will be fine if we get some sleep. Get some sleep. Get some rest. I have, I have been in seasons where I have heard people from stage say this and think to myself, that is a great idea, but I have a baby, and so that's hilarious. Unless you want to come watch her. You're like, come, come watch her, and then, you know, I'll get plenty of sleep. But, so I get, it's, it's not perfect. This isn't me getting up here and saying, if you don't get this much sleep, then you're a sinner. But, it, it, well, you are. We all are, but you know what I mean. But we need some sleep. We need to get some sleep. If Jesus needed the rest, so do we. Trust that things will be okay, even if we get a little bit of rest. 
The, the, the reality is a lack of sleep doesn't just affect our physical well-being, which, we, which everybody knows, but it affects our attitudes to, towards each other. And if we're supposed to be, as followers of Christ, a good witness for him, it, it, it really matters how we treat other people. And it's really hard to treat other people well when you are running on fumes. So I get it. This isn't the main part of the story. This isn't the biggest part of, the, the, of what we're talking about, but get some sleep. This is your permission. Go home and take a nap if you can today. But let's pick it up. Let's continue reading in uh, verse 39. Uh, and he, Jesus, and he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So here, what we see here and over the next couple sections of Mark that we'll look, like, look at in the coming weeks, we see Jesus here controlling nature. And that we're going to see is we're going to see um, in, the, in the next section, we're going to see him controlling demons, and then we're going to see him raise someone from the dead. So these three things kind of work together where we see him controlling the physical world, the spiritual world, and that he has power over death itself. So this is not just a standalone story, but this all go, works together to show the power that Jesus has. And if we continue in verse 40, we can finish out this section. It says, He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So again, we see, as we do so often in the book of Mark, the, the um, lack of faith and the lack of understanding that the disciples have highlighted here. They are the ones that followed Jesus personally, and even they didn't understand who he truly was. Because this wasn't, this story, this is such a common story that I feel like we can lose some of its gravity now because this isn't just Jesus performing another miracle. This is not on the same um, kind of, doesn't have the same gravity as Jesus performing a healing miracle for somebody. See, in this time, the, as, as, as um, you know, these people would have had access to the Hebrew scriptures and if they would have grown up learning them, God, or Yahweh, is the only one who has the power to control nature, to control the winds and the waves. We see that all the way from creation to imparting the Red Sea, and multiple times in the Old Testament, talks about how God has the power over the wind and over the seas. And so the, his disciples and people would have seen this and not just thought of it as just another miracle. This is him showing that he has the power that only God himself has. And so this is why they're responding by saying, who is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Who is this that has the power that God himself has that, that, that is only reserved for God, but yet this man who we're following has this same power? This is why they're looking at him with such fear and in such wonder. But Jesus is showing what, that he can do what only God can do. And see, the disciples were wise in turning to him. We can see, obviously, they went to him when they were in fear. But what they said to Jesus shows their lack of faith even still. They asked him, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care that we're going to die? Do something here. And I think that's so often how we go to Jesus. I don't know about you, but myself, I, I'm, I'm very good at turning to God. But I'm also very good at turning to God in this way. Of, of not showing, not necessarily just showing, not showing faith, but showing, God, why don't you just do something here? And accusing him. And that's what we see the disciples doing here. And so what I want us to do is I want us to kind of keep this story in mind. The disciples, the winds, the waves, Jesus calming them, their response. And then what we're going to do is we're going to flip to a story in the Old Testament and of, of another story of somebody waiting on God to act. And I want us to look at these two examples and see kind of the differences in response that these people have in, in, as they're waiting on God to do something or to save them. So kind of keep that in mind, and then what we're going to do is we're going to turn back to the book of Habakkuk. So uh, if you've never read the book of Habakkuk, it's somewhere in the middle-ish. Uh, it's in one of the minor prophets, so if you're flipping around in your Bible, you get to the point where all the books are like one page long, you're about in the right section. Um, but these verses will also be on the screen, and so what, what I'm going to do is we're going to go through the entire book, but we're not going to read it all. I'm just going to give summaries for sections, and we'll read a couple verses so we kind of get an idea of what's going on here. But we're going to see another example of somebody waiting on God to do something and see how their response looks against what the disciples, how the disciples responded when they were waiting for Jesus to save them. So the, the way the book of Habakkuk works, he's one of the Old Testament minor prophets, and how the book is structured is it's very, it's very basic. It's, it's him crying out to God or making a plea to God or asking him to do something, God responding, him responding to God based on God's response, God responding back, and then chapter three is a whole chapter's worth of a song of praise to God. So it's just, it, sometimes this Old Testament language is a little tough and stuff like that, but all it is is a conversation. It's him to God, back to him to God, and then a song of praise. 
And so how the book starts, the first four verses are his kind of cry out to God. And what, it's, what's, what he's saying here and, and what he's crying out to God is he's, he's crying out to God because the people of Judah in the region that he's in are wicked. They're acting unjustly. He's saying that they're not following the Torah. They're not following the law. And the, um, justice is overlooked. And he's asking God, why don't you do something about your people here? You know, they're, they're, they're acting wickedly. God, please come and do something about it. And then we see God's response that starts in uh, chapter 1, verse 5. And this is the first verse of God's response. God says back to him, he says, Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. And let me tell you, that sounds so good. That is just like, that is something that you get printed on the wall, that you get on a mug, and people do. Go on Etsy, they're there. And this is, this is like one of those verses that God is going to be working all things together for my good. And uh, you will not believe it, even if you were told things are going to be great, and it just feels so good. But then you keep reading, and you find that what God is telling him that he's going to be amazed by is that God is currently raising up the Babylonians, who are the most wicked and powerful and ruthless nation, and they're going to come and destroy you. Hold up. Like, this is, and so this, this is what he's being told, that God's saying, no, I didn't forget. I got you covered. I, I'm going to do something about it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise up this evil and ruthless nation, and they're going to come and destroy all of you. And then the next section is his response. And his, he responds by basically saying, what are you talking about? Like, these people are way less just than we are. They're way more wicked. Do you not realize how ruthless they are? They're not just powerful, but they leave a trail of nations and bodies in their wake. They, they are the epitome of evil here. And then God responds again by telling him that even though he's going to use Babylon, this evil nation, for his will, that he will deal justly with them in time. But that's probably not going to happen in your lifetime. So by the end of the book, we see that his, his situation hasn't improved at all. In fact, it's gotten far worse. He's learned that God is going to intervene, but in doing so, going to send this nation to destroy them. And there will be justice in time, but that time probably will not come in his own lifetime. So how would we respond to this? Like, we're probably not going to be in this situation, literally, the same situation ever, but how would, you, how, how would we respond if we we're praying to God and we got the, the thing that every Christian wants, an audible response from God, an audible answer of, I hear your prayers and I will do something about it, but things are about to get way worse than you ever imagined and I will answer your prayer, but it's going to be after you're dead great. Like this, how would we respond to this? Would we respond by getting frustrated? Would we respond by asking God, what are you talking about? But as we continue reading, as we get to the end of the book, we see his response. As he's just been told this news that has surely got to be difficult and confusing and hard to wrestle with, the whole third chapter is a song written to God, but it ends starting in verse 16 with this. It says, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and he enables me to tread on the heights. See, this is what it looks like to faithfully wait on God. Not to expect everything to turn out the way that we want. Not to expect everything to be perfect. But he's saying that even if everything goes wrong, even if everything that we're expecting to happen goes the opposite way, if everything goes wrong and all we face is hardship and trouble, I will still rejoice in the Lord because he is sovereign over all and he is where my strength comes from. So here we have two stories. We have the disciples who run to Jesus, good, but they run to Jesus and they accuse him and they shake him awake saying, don't you care if we die? They don't wait, him to, wait for him to do something. They're, they're trying to take him into their own hands saying, God, do something here. Jesus, do something here. Don't you care what's happening? And then we see Habakkuk, that he still goes to God, same way, still cries out to God, but upon learning that things are going to get much worse, he still praises God and patiently waits for him to act. 
So how do we wait on God? How do we wait on God? What does it look like when we're facing this and we have to wait on God to answer? You know, we are um, uh, going through and coming out, but still going through a, a really tough season at home with a couple of our uh, foster kids that left. And it's, it's been a, a terrible year, end of last year and beginning of this year. And it's been filled with a lot of questions and a lot of frustration and a lot of anger and a lot of prayer and a lot of wondering what's going to happen and what's, what God is doing. And I would love, I would love to say that my response every time I prayed and every time I wondered was to say that I will rejoice in the Lord. Even if everything goes wrong, I will praise you and I'll have faith that it'll all turn out. But the reality is, I am far more like the disciples. I am far more like the disciples. I cannot tell you how many nights I have had praying and feeling like I am shaking Jesus by the collar, saying, why don't you wake up? Do you see what's going on here? Why don't you do something about this? Man, there are kids at stake here. Why are you asleep? But here's the reality. Even though the disciples had little faith, Jesus still saved them. And even when we have little faith, a small amount of faith, he still saves us. He still answers those prayers. It may not come in the timing we want. It may not come in the way that we want. It may not come in the way we expect, but he is still in control and he still saves. And he's, he still is working all things out according to his will. So when we ask the question, how do we faithfully wait on God? I think, I think the answer here is, that faithfulness is just the willingness to wait on God. It's not to have everything perfect. It's not to have every time we're waiting on God, have it all worked out. But I think we faithfully wait on God by just being willing to do so. By willing to acknowledge that he is the one in control and I'm not. That he is the one who is working all things together and can see the big picture in so much of a grander and better way than I can. Faithfulness is realizing that his timing is perfect and mine is so far from it that he is sovereign, that he is in control, and he has the ultimate victory. And that's hard to do sometimes. That's really hard to do. And so I want to, as we end here, I want to, I'm gonna, in, a, in a second I'm going to read this passage from the book of Lamentations, and I hope it just offers some encouragement. But I also want us to be real with each other and that we are human <laughs> And that we are not going to have this all together 100% of the time, every time. And so I hope, my hope and my prayer, and I believe that we are, but I hope that we can continue to improve in this, is that as, as a church here at Lake Springs, we are a place that we can come with questions and doubts and wondering of what God is doing. And that as we walk through these doors, we don't have to pretend like we understand it all, that we have it all together that we even agree with what we feel like God is doing, that we can come here and be honest with each other and that we can, to each other, be a shoulder to cry on and a shoulder to lean on. Not to have any answers, but just to go through it together. You know, as we've been going through this difficult season, I've had a couple of people reach out for this, with this and say the exact same thing, and it's been the most helpful thing. Of people reaching out and saying, I have no answers for you. I have nothing to say. But if you want, I can come over and we can just cry. And I hope that we, and I think that we are. I hope we can continue to be a church that offers that to each other, where we can just be support. We're not a place that has every answer, but we can just pray with each other and care for each other. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close as we read this passage. It'll be on the screens if you wanna read along or you can just listen. But I, I hope we can see this and we can rest assured that even though things don't always look the way that we want and things can be difficult at times, but that God still loves us and that he is still in control. So Lamentations chapter 3, starting with verse 19. It says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Let's pray together.
God, it is really hard to wait sometimes. God, I thank you that you are the one in control, that our waiting is not in vain, that even when we don't understand what you're doing and don't understand your timing, that you are still in control and working all things out according to your will. And God, I thank you for that because my will is selfish. My will is is not for the ultimate good, but yours is. But God, I pray for myself and for everyone here as we're going through these seasons of waiting and going through these seasons of confusion and difficulty that we can rely on each other, that we, you can give us the wisdom and the knowledge to know who needs a, a shoulder to cry on and who needs, who needs that... Um, who needs that friendship? And God, I pray that we are that for each other. God, I thank you that you give the ultimate comfort more so than we could ever give each other. Yeah, we love you and pray in Jesus' name.